Heath Davis, how are you? Hi, uh, I'm uh, doing pretty well uh, at the moment. So, uh, yeah, the movie's out on screen. So, uh, there's always an element of uh, relief when uh, when it's out. And, uh, yeah, it's after all the hard work. But, you know, there's always the element of uh, anxiety of uh, are people going to go and see it as well? So. Okay, well, we'll get to that in a little while. But just firstly, if, say, you ran into somebody in a foyer and they were thinking of going to see the latest sequel to some rom-com comedy piece right. of whatever from Hollywood, <laughs> and next <laughs> and next to that poster was a poster for your film, yep. and you were there, and uh, they asked you, what is this film about? Should I go see it? What would you say to them? Uh, I kind of picture it as... Um, I, I, I kind of say, have you ever had a dream? And, um, and you know... Most people have a dream, and I'll say, what if it looked like that dream was about to come true? Um, and then at the very last minute, someone took it away from you. How would you feel about that? And uh, most people don't like that feeling. So, um, so this is a story about that, really, um, and told through a sort of black comedy guys. So, yeah, it's a, it's a real, it's real and it's truthful. So it's an alternative to what else is out there. Um, it's also confronting, but... Um, at its heart, it's very noble and, uh, yeah, it has a big heart, but um, also very funny and, uh, yeah, and has a lot of pathos as well. So, yeah, the pigeonhole, you'd say it's a black comedy about uh, about the disappointments of life. I am very keen to see some of the other uh, themes that you were teasing out in this movie because basically you've got a curmudgeonly teacher who seems to have sort of contempt for everybody else because he sees himself as being slightly above everyone else, yet he's also willing to compromise um, uh, when it's convenient for him. Is of course, after the publication of his second book, Hardest Thing in the World to Do, um, and he gets accepted on condition that he changes the book, which is something he embraces. Tell me about this theme of compromise versus principle that you pursued? Uh, well, sometimes to keep swinging the oak as a filmmaker or an artist, you've got to compromise. So, um, And, you know, even when you're really noble to the themes and the story and the cause of uh, uh, your art or your film in this instance, you do have to compromise. I mean, in life we make compromises every single day, but in making a film, even when I, you know, on such a low budget, when you're controlling... Uh, you know the film a lot. You're still compromising. You're compromising with every uh, every single person you have involved in the movie. You're compromising with the schedule that you have. You're compromising with the weather. All you do is kind of compromise in a film, and you hope like hell that you don't compromise too much to get you know majority of that DNA in your movie. So, but in regards to Mr. Cutler, he's kind of at his wit's end, and he's decided after uh, lots of pain and suffering um, to compromise and write something that was sort of trendy. And what sort of annoys him most is that he's done that, but it, he still hasn't been able to appease the people, you know. And uh, this was just a, a sort of complete trashy text that would make him relevant again. And his ideal was if I can compromise and give them what they want, then I'll be able to get, you know, the thing that I love most up and it's kind of like one for them and one for me but um, it, life doesn't work out like that. So. Uh, well, given uh, how much compromising went into the um, the making of the film and you're absolutely right of course even A-level directors talk about having to cut corners and having to make do with something they've shot and so on so at the end of the day you look at the film, tell me how happy you are with what's actually up there. Oh, look, I'm pretty... I'm actually really happy because for the limited amount of money that we had in the time, um, it was very close to kind of the vision that I set out to achieve. And I kind of wrote the this, budget, this script with the budget that we had. So if I had sort of gone out and, uh, you know, had written something and it cost a little bit more and... I didn't end up, I guess, with the truth and and all the elements and the and the you know the bit of sweetness that you know I, I I infused into the screenplay that I would be 
a little bit disappointed, but I've got to say, majority of it is up there. There's always elements of, uh, you know, days and time and tools that we didn't have at our disposal. But really, uh, you know, the story and the themes and um, that personal ability comes across. So I'm happy with that. But, um, you know, you're never fully happy. I don't know if anybody is, but what was in my head, um, generally trans... Uh, third onto the screen and and you know i actually got all i was really determined to get all the locations and and where i'd written the script and film in those and so i got all of those sort of tools so i was quite happy uh in getting in depicting that and sort of yeah and keeping it as i said real and honest that i think you know for better or worse we achieved that did you uh, get any government money for this film we uh, well at the very beginning we did apply to try and get a you know a, a decent sort of budget and uh, we so we were rejected but not fully rejected. There was this the elements of the script that I like um, the sort of powers that be didn't like um, probably it's a bit in, in politically incorrect at the moment and um, people always throw around this term of unlikable protagonist and. And you know what? I, uh, unlikable protagonist. You, there's nowhere it's said that you have to like a protagonist, and you've got to identify with them as important and make them interesting. But really, likable people um, are boring. On can, can, can you please um, please unpack just for a moment the, those elements that um, rubbed against the officialdom you're saying that there were elements apart from the unlikable nature of the main character what else did they find objectionable in terms of political correctness or whatever uh look this is the obvious one and we're you know i've written this film a long time ago and it's a combination of personal experience and people i've worked with and, and life really so that's kind of you know i was adamant to just write from the point of view of an artist or a teacher in this uh, in this instance and you know and this guy is a little bit of a, a user of people he's a womanizer he's um but he you know, he's a misanthrope and he doesn't you know he doesn't like really anybody frankly because he's so frustrated and disappointed at his station in life and i think you know the powers would be it's probably interpreted that in some way as being misogynistic um but you know i i could counteract that and with my rebuttal and say he's surrounded by very strong women and and they sort of you know turn kick his butt behind and and sort of inspire his mm. transformation somewhat but um yeah but yeah, that's an argument that's uh against but they were you know on the other side of the fence and they did uh give us a little bit of money to sort of rework the script and i did and it still probably was a little bit taboo but i don't think they understood on the page what I was trying to do and the screenplays are schematics you know they're, they're designed to be written for the screen and um, you know and that was I guess the nature of the landscape at the moment and then thankfully we, we shot uh, the film I stuck to my guns and scraped together with very little money and showed them a cut and they kind of understood what we are trying to do and sort of Screen Australia came on board and gave us some completion funds, which I'm very happy with. Okay, okay, so they did come through in the end. Listen, can I just mm. ask you frankly, and it's only because it's uh, another example of something that has come up in other discussions with other filmmakers, um, w when they were objecting to certain elements of your screenplay, were they framing those objections in terms of the commercial viability of the film, or were they more value-based objections oh, we don't like the fact that this guy has an issue with women, for instance? Uh, it was never commercial viability. I mean, I don't think that word commercial viability gets actually mentioned with Australian film because they're very hard to, you know, to turn into profit. But, um, yeah, I guess it was mostly, um, you know, opinions um, and I guess, uh, you know, their concerns being a government body and and supporting a film that might be you know, misconstrued or not just misconstrued, just interpreted in one way by certain fractions and then, uh, you know, people, you know, might get angry. And we've had a few small fractions and of, um, I guess, some sort of certain feminist groups, and, and I'm a feminist too, I'm a big believer of equal rights and um, for all, but, um, you know, that didn't really 
respond to the Cutler character at all, and that sort of takes him away from the story. But um, I guess you're never going to appease anybody. And but you know, um, some of my favourite characters in film, like or TV, like Don Draper and Mad Men, or Walter White and Breaking Bad, or Travis Bickle, De Niro, and Taxi Driver. I mean, you can't. These guys aren't very likable. So. Um, but they're very, very engaging and very interesting. Well, also, look, what's clear in your film, as is clear in not only the films you just mentioned, but in so many um, films and TV shows featuring male characters, is that just because you have an issue with women or just because you find the concept of, of, of women and dealing with women a bit difficult in life, that doesn't make you a misogynist. That just makes you a human being, surely. Yeah, I mean, most of uh, you know, most of the most of our issues are uh, are internal, and we often manifest them in the wrong kind of ways. And um, men and women, um, you know, are, are sort of people been writing about these. Shakespeare's been writing about these stories forever. So these are nothing kind of. Um, the human condition is always about that and you know I've had a partner and a child as a young girl and and I'm always talking thinking about my relationships and where I can do better and where I'm doing wrong and my film's about human connection and um, humans are of both genders so yeah, I mean uh, if the uh, response of the screenplay were less ideological and more along the lines of uh, listen, Heath, if you change this aspect of the character or this part of the story, you will actually increase your chances of getting a bigger audience. Would you have preferred that kind of response? Uh, maybe, but, um, you know, there's no guarantees in that either. I just didn't really... Um, then that was sort of proposed, and I considered it because I'm not a pig-headed guy to, to think about that, but I, I didn't really see that um, as the story and the character that I really wanted to tell. I wanted to, um, you know, to depict it honestly, and it wasn't just this This man's very got a lot of vices, but it was really what I really wanted to do at the end of the day is accurately depict what it's like to be um, an artist, somebody with ability and talent um, that is just not relevant and contemporary anymore. And how uh and you know and we're talking about a male mr cutler and how uh how it is to come to terms with that i guess that failure and acknowledgement and and this is how he sort of gets by and you know he's got a lot of vices and he treats a lot of people badly then that's mostly be from his frustrations and mostly because of his internal issues so um yeah so it wasn't i mean really saw it like that. I just saw it as the story about this this gentleman. My one main critical observation of your film, which I enjoyed uh, from the performances, I think you really got a great suite of performances there from a really good ensemble cast. I mean, there's a lot of characters in this film, but I did feel that the film was so busy with so many storylines going on that uh, they all seem to be uh, a stories, you know, as in A level stories. S certain storylines perhaps should have been more prominent and more overriding some of the other stories. I'm wondering whether that was something that's either come up in discussion, um, whether you should have maybe emphasized two or three stories a lot and maybe dialed down some of the others. What do you think? Uh, maybe, um, you know, I mean, when you're making this sort of an ensemble piece, I probably didn't realise it until I sort of cast everybody and were there on day one. I went, geez, we've got a lot of actors here. Um, uh, but I kind of wanted to build the chaos of what it's like to be sort of a teacher and to be this guy at a crisis. And, um, and a lot of things happen to you all at once in life generally. So, and my other thing, I wanted to sort of be the sort of antithesis of a lot of indie films and Australian films where um, we have an A plot and, and generally there's not enough juice in the A plot. I didn't um, want to be boring and I knew we didn't have a lot um, of tools in terms of uh, like camera techniques and things of such nature to bring another element to the film. So I was like, well, all I have really is locations and people um, and I wanted to add a few sort of plot lines to keep it interesting. Um, you know, I might have overstuffed the turkey here or there. I'll probably look back in five years and go, okay, I did that. But um, I sort of would rather be ambitious and uh, and do that rather than sort of bore people and, and 
underplay it. But yeah, just a lot of it was based on experience and so many things, you know, generally when you a, a chaos or a crisis falls upon you in your life, uh, they say things happen in threes. And uh, yeah, and I had those discussions with script editors. They were like, oh, look, you know, generally the formula for a film like this is there's one thing that's the bomb that happens to him and then he's got to combat that. And But, you know, life doesn't kind of work out that way. So... Yeah, I sort of stuck to my guns, again, for better or Yeah, worse. but I've heard of that uh, that screenplay uh, approach or that screenplay theory where you have the main trunk of a story and everything else can branch off and can detour, but everything's got to come back to the main branch. I don't yeah. want to get too technical here. No, 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 of course. We don't bore people, but you're completely right, and that was, you know, when you're making a low-budget film too, you kind of... Like, you don't want to go too safe. Uh, I probably went a bit safe in some areas with this film, but I wanted it to be a bit more accessible than my last film. And you make it on such a small budget, you're going to take a few risks and you want to try something. Some will work, some won't work. But, um, you know, to stand out, you've got dish an alternative. And otherwise, you, what's the point in kind of making another sort of by-the-numbers derivative film on a low budget when, you know, you can get a big budget and you're forced to do that? So how much did this film end up costing you to make? How many favours did you have to pull in? Oh, my God. I can't answer the favours because there's so many, <laughs> many and I'm still bloody uh, still, giving, still giving them up. But people are really supportive. Um, oh, look, uh, in, terms of per, in terms of actual cash, um, to get in a cam was about 100000 um, and we that was paying all the actors and crew members all their award wages. So, but that was friend, you know, locations and all these things were all free because I'd pulled in favors from areas I worked at, and I wrote specifically for that budget where I knew I could get these things and not those things. And that's very hard. That's twenty one days of filming, six day weeks, and shooting on your day off, and and minimal coverage um, with one camera and shooting for the edit and. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's any kind of film at that budget level is hard. Most of those budgets don't see the light of day, but there's a lot of uh, pre thought into it. Um, and yeah, so I mean, for what we had to play with, and that's when it comes back to compromise, there was a bigger draft where I had these moments that I thought were great, and uh, we had to just sort of murder your babies and, and get real. But um, yeah, for what we sort of set out to achieve, I think we did quite well. How much is crowdfunded? Half of that, pretty much. Oh, that's so, not bad. Yeah, we did about 41 or 2 or something, and then the last film broke. I, we met, we, that was a smell of an early rag movie also, and uh, made some money on that, and I threw in the rest of that to get us over the line. So, you know, I hopefully don't have... You don't want to keep doing that. Um, it's not sexy, it's hard, and <laughs> yeah, you don't get pay. It's very. It's just hard. There's a lot of favors and there's a lot of sweaty investment. But um, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. I did want to pull focus just on how long it took you to shoot. Did you say you shot this entire film in 21 days? That's correct. Yeah. So we don't um, have a lot of time. No, that's not a lot of time. I keep saying that there should be a special award given to filmmakers who can actually pull together a film under extraordinary stress, extraordinary circumstances with a tiny amount of money and actually come out with a coherent film. That's remarkable. Yeah. Well, thank you. It is. It's very hard. I mean, I know a lot of, I've seen a lot of films at film festivals and a lot of friends have made films on that budget. And I actually didn't realise the scope of this film until I turned up on day one, especially with extras. Like, this is a school film and all the kids that I taught up in the area. We had, like, hundreds. We actually auditioned over 2,000 people for bit roles and extra roles because I was afraid we'd get nobody. And then we, you know, we had to keep them around because we needed the school for two weeks and it had to be populated. And, and I didn't, you know, have an AD. I just or I had a, a line producer who was a couple of uh, roles and we were juggling all of that and positioning people and... And that was really incredibly uh, time-consuming and hard also. So, um, But, you know, and there was a lot of inexperienced crew members surrounded by loyal friends I've worked with a long time that are experienced. So um, just dealing with the personalities and it's summer and Katoomba and everyone's minimum wage and it's long hours and incredibly hard. Like, there's a lot of just those variables that can sort of sour a film. So, yeah, there's a bit of a minor miracle that it all turned out. And you do have another film in the can, I understand, called Locusts. Yeah, so this film had been sort of boiling in the background, and I'm 
just the director on that. It's a genre film um, of sorts. It's a drama, dark drama, thriller set in the outback. Um, that was a bigger budget. Actually, you know, we had camera cars and stunts and things like that. So um, that was great learning learning curve for me and to show that I can do more than just sort of introspective uh, character studies. I can sort of, you know, make things uh, look kind of dynamic. Um, if we can talk just a few minutes, mate, just about the circumstance uh, uh, behind this film. Um, I understand that you spent about a decade in Hollywood trying to get a particular film up and the um, experience was, was less than a... <laughs> was less than gratifying. Can you tell me a little bit about what led up to this film, your stints as a teacher, and uh, if you're a full-time... You're, I take it you're a full-time filmmaker now? Uh, well, at the moment, but you uh, you never know until, you know, sort of job comes. So, yeah, between uh, now and the end of the year, I can... I, I was just saying that the other night on one of our form. I said, oh, I can write filmmaker at the moment. I said, I don't know about next year, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah. So. Okay. So, can you just tell us about the the prehistory about um, you, you, about you going to Hollywood and trying to get a film up? What type of film was it? What What's it like living in development hell? I guess is the basic question. Uh, I want to you ask. Know what? Um, and I try and break down the the barriers. I've sort of had to do that because I grew up in like Penrith and Mount Druitt in Western Sydney, there's not a lot of filmmakers or influential people out there, so all you do is just knock down doors constantly. Um, but nobody really speaks the truth in film land, so there's a lot, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one um, that's gone through hardship, but it's not um, cool to actually mention that. It's always cool to, uh, pre- uh, you know, to sort of represent that you're succeeding, and that's half the problem with filmmaking because it's just not the truth it's a lot of smoke and mirrors but I just uh, you know I was young I was naive I'd finished film school I made a short film that did quite well and I'd written this drama on spec um, and that short film was kind of like a calling card for that film and what um, was the people... short film sorry what was the short film uh, it's a short film called Spoon Man that I made in yeah 2003 and uh, yeah and that sort of went around and, and people were asked me what I had next and I said I've written this film and then all of a sudden things word gets around really quickly I've no, I've discovered and I've written this script that I thought was good and it was people really dug it and then when somebody says it's good somebody else endorses it and it's all of a sudden there's this like kind of snowball effect of people who haven't even read it but know of it and think it's good and it was kind of like you know maybe the hot girl in school thinks you're not bad looking and then all of a sudden all the girls are interested in you it's sort of a weird thing and um, and we went through an option with some good producers and that, and that didn't work out and then another option and options are a horrible thing because you lose con- power and you write a film on a thinking it's just this character driven thing that won't require a lot of money um, producers want to get paid a lot budgets inflate um, agents get involved with packaging and all of a sudden this sort of you know million dollar film has become a ten million dollar film and you need these sort of names to trigger that and you know, good production houses hedge their bets, so they will rather have eight films, and one or one of those films will get up. And if you're one of the other seven, um, too bad. And as a filmmaker and director, when you write something to direct, and ten years later, plus some, you you haven't made your film, it's really disheartening. So, um, you know, and I learn a lot about mostly about how the business is sort of conducted and how people treat each other and what films get made now and you know i wrote that film early 2000s and that was sort of the end of the drama run essentially and to get a drama up you need a big movie star and i thought we had good movie stars they weren't big enough still and um yeah it's a funny it's a funny business and it's all or nothing it's they people are your best friend one day and they don't talk to you the next and so we got close several times, and on the third time we shut down the day before because money fell out apparently. And uh, then I went back home three weeks later, and I needed a job, and I started casual teaching in my hometown. And everybody was going, "What's going on with this movie? Where you shouldn't you be here?" And yeah, it was uh, it was a tough pill to swallow. Um, but then I sort of started writing for uh, sort of therapy because I've always been a writer, and if I'm not writing, I don't feel like I've lived the day properly. So. Um, I just always been a believer in writing what you know, and I've been I was writing kind of what I was living at the time, and um, 
and then it sort of steamrolled from there and um I got reconnected with the guys I'd made my short films with who were back in Australia and they were like, let's just go make a film, you know. And um, I had a mate who did uh, succeeded in a crowdfunding campaign in New York and I thought, geez, if I wrote this film for about this much with the gear that we have, we could actually go and make a film. And, uh, yeah, and that was Broke, the film I made in 2016, and that was a great experience that we did it again with Book Week and... Um, yeah, but now I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> what was the what was that original film that you took to Hollywood? What was that movie? What was it about? Uh, I try not to talk about it because it hurts me too. But uh, ah. it's a redemption story. So um, say again. Yeah, it's a redemption story, really. Um, and uh, it's about a guy who's a bully in school that reconnects with somebody that he tormented and. Um, it's set sort of 20 years later. It's a really beautiful film and great. Really, really love that script. And it's really got a lot of heart and some great characters. And um, all the, it's got the DNA of the films that I've made since then. But, um, you know, we could make that film on, on a regular budget. But, um, you know, not every, everybody makes films for different reasons, I've noticed. Um, they're not all about just getting a story made. There's not a lot of artists in Hollywood. They're just. Um, it's a it's a business. I've met some big producers and um, probably the biggest, and they will tell you no one cares about Oscars. They care about making money, and um, you don't know. Everyone's got a different course, and I've learned that course. Hmm. Now, yeah. if you actually moved, did you move to Hollywood or you moved to Vancouver? I lived. In, yeah, I, um, I I I went to and fro because we couldn't get a visa, um, but. It, being young, you got that Canadian visa, and flights to Vancouver uh, to LA are very cheap. Um, we do road trips. I do a road trip too, but uh, I would sort of spend three months in LA and go back to Vancouver and go back. And sometimes we had project visas when the project was up, and then when it didn't, I'd go back. And... So, so, can you tell me? Uh, and this is a question that's almost never asked when you hear about people trying hard to get a film made for a long period of time. So you spent approximately 10 years in Hollywood trying to get a film made. It didn't get made. How did you live? Uh, I lived very difficultly. I did difficult. <laughs> yeah, I um, did a jack of different jobs. I kept writing, so uh, a bit of development money on other projects, which, um, which helped. I uh, worked on film sets. So I learned a lot about filmmaking, and I've never been afraid to just do whatever job. Um, but yeah, I worked on some big budget films and starting as PAs and doing assisting directing and all that sort of stuff. I worked on bad TV movies. Um, yeah, all different kinds of budgets. In Vancouver, they make a lot of product. Um, they're definitely called product in that town. And yeah, and then, uh, you know, on off days, I worked uh, I worked in a sales job too. And yeah, I did a, a multitude of jobs. None of them were film related, but I was always writing. And then I realized, shit, it's... I'm a filmmaker and I'm not making anything. So, Did you ever get depressed? Mate, did I ever get depressed? Jesus, the whole time, I'd say. Um, uh, yeah, you know, but uh, I, I was very dem demoralised and depressed. And I sort of, I gave up several times, but then I got more depressed because I was like, this is my life calling and I'm not doing it. And um, Yeah, it was, it was kind of more depressing when you sort of, you give up on your dream, whatever it is in life, if you sort of, give it up then it's really you, you sort of lose a part of your identity and your purpose so but yeah I've, so I've got a it's still incredibly hard but um i've got a, i've got a balance with it now a little bit it's it's um yeah i've, I've learned to uh meditate um and i've learned to try and enjoy the process a little bit because it's um you know each each day uh and there's no other way you can live your life. And I probably spent 10 years not being in the moment and thinking too far ahead. These moments when you're feeling really down, how do they manifest? Do you just find yourself sitting down to have dinner and you're just staring down at the plate for 30 minutes or you're watching TV for six hours and you have no idea what you've just seen? Uh, I was probably a bit of a melancholy kid and I, I think I probably... I, I, I'm not, I've taken antidepressants for a long time, so I probably had that as a child in my family. So I've had bouts of depression, um, and mostly it's just 
it's not literally like that. It comes over time. It's just this feeling of, uh, I guess, worthlessness and not finding joy in the things that you might. And, yeah, it's a lethargy. But, um, uh, yeah, and, and, and it's tough in Vancouver. And Canada's got a high depression rate anyway because the sun hardly ever comes out. And sun's very important uh, for guys like myself. And But, uh, you know, I've sort of had a bit of a dance with it for a while. So when I felt moments like that, I'm really active. I go to the gym and I try and, um, you know, do physical physical things and meditate and yoga and all of those sort of things really helps. Um, But you know what? Sometimes when the down came with the film, there was always an up. So it might be a week or two of feeling down in the dumps, but there was a carrot always or a silver line. And that always sparked you back up. And that was more dangerous than than anything else because it was almost like a, a heroin or something it was a drug and uh, you couldn't you couldn't give it up because there was always something there there's always something there and someone's always telling you something so um you know i learned a lot about myself in that period of time and how i want to live my life and the films i want to make and how i want to make them and um yeah you've got to be in control and you've got to try and choose the people you want to create with and sometimes that means not a lot of money but um yeah and how's the, fr- how's the frame of mind now compared to those low points oh look i'm pretty i'm in a pretty good place i've made three things and um you know what it's um yeah i, I wouldn't wish that upon anyone that experience and a lot of people have <laughs> happened. um but yeah you sort of you can't i can kind of go look if i never make another film i've made three i can rest my hat on that and go okay but um yeah, I'd like to be able to just be a writer, director now and not have to worry about all those other elements because um, you get older and uh, time. I'm very mindful of time and we don't have a lot of it. A lot of people in that kind of state, in the middle of development hell, might very well have said, look, I'm going to cut my losses here. I'm going to realise that this isn't working and I will move on to something else. This is something you obviously could have done, but you yeah. didn't. I'm always interested in the creative impulse that keeps people going oh look i have a very famous actor told me once that i've been bitten by the bug um and i should just surrender to it and that's just the way it is um and i guess it's a calling and if you're not living your calling uh in a, in a strange way i have a friend who's a priest and when he told me that he got his calling and he was going to join become a man of the cloth i kind of understood um other filmmakers will tell you it's just it's just in your crawl it's your dna and if you're not doing it you're not really breathing and you're not fully sort of happy even though sometimes it's not that great for you but um yeah you don't really have a choice i often wish i wish that was the case um but you just really don't have a choice and uh yeah it's a it's a love i kind of have a love-hate relationship with it now do you have to be just a little bit insane a little bit crazy to be a filmmaker yeah, you gotta be and you gotta be a little bit crazy to want to actually do it all yourself and push it out there you, you do um but it can be it's also the most uh, at times rewarding amazing thing you can do but it's uh comes in small it comes in small doses it's just a lot around it um it could be easier if our country and our culture actually embraced the arts and supported what we did more um it's funny when you go to different parts of the world at festivals or meet other filmmakers uh you know like teaching filmmaking is like really highly regarded and uh people get out and embrace you what you have to say over here it's very isolating and and difficult so uh, i can kind of understand i can kind of understand in other parts of the world why people do it and, and it's really you know it's endorsed, but um, often here it's sort of you know criticised, and you're you know you're an artist, you're you're a bludger, and all of these things that come with that. So. That's very interesting. I've never heard it quite put that way. It's a very interesting thing to hear. Not at all. I mean, where I grew up, it's a very you know it's working class, and most people are tradies, and um, it's still very kind of alpha male, and it's still very much get up at you know six and come home at six, and you provide it, and if you don't live within those means you're you know you're lazy and uh you know i get i work incredibly hard obsessive like 24 hours a day as making films and make no money um and the jobs that i do nine to five i don't work very hard and i get paid a lot more so uh, that's one of the bitter 
uh, bitter pills you got to swallow, and that sort of you know inspired the film a lot too. So. Uh, look, you, you probably know better than anyone, and you were probably expecting this that the film has finally come out. It's been out a few days. It's gotten what can best be described as a couple of dismissive reviews, um, not including mine. Mine isn't up yet. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's obviously not going to run for a long time. Um, how do you, at the end of the day, assess the, 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 the value of the film to you? Are you looking forward to it having an afterlife uh, in streaming? Um, how do you feel about the, um, that situation? Uh, yeah. uh, look, I feel, you know, like most filmmakers, you sort of, um, you know, you want your film to have a life, you want it to be seen, but I'm a, I'm a very much a realist. And um, before I jump on board any project, I think very calculated because I know how long it takes to make a film. And um, they're a kind of stepping stone in a broader body of work. Film's a long-term game. So I kind of made, for my own reasons, I made this film as a... Uh, as a career jumper, I didn't want to be a guy who made one movie and never made another film. I wanted to make another film that was different to the first and there was a story that I could make on the uh, on that budget that I had and there was a bit of momentum. Um, so I wanted to do that as well. Um, and I set my own parameter for success because if you don't, you'll be very disappointed, especially here. So doesn't you know financially, it's not a huge outlay, um, but really, it's a you know it's another film. It's competently directed and the story told that's fresh under my belt and I can, you know, show people, you know, I've made a couple of movies on lower budgets that I can direct. Um, so, yeah, but streaming things, most people are going to stream things now. It's it's tough for a film like this because when it plays to an audience, it really moves people. and It's like going to a rock concert and, uh, you know, you're in there with 100 people. The atmosphere brings an energy and then when you, you know, maybe watch that concert at home on TV, it's not the same. So that's all film stuff are that fake comedies dead more than others. Um, but that's just the reality of, you know, where we are now. So, you know, you want people to watch it and hopefully most people get are obviously going to watch it on digital platforms. But, um, yeah, it's, it's about getting the next one happening now. So um, and that hopefully you get a little bit bigger with every film. So.